Back on the Falcons Audible, presented by AT&T. Your same crew is back with you. That's DJ Shockley, Dave Archer. I'm Derek Rackley, and we are here to break it all down from the Falcons' Sunday night unfortunate defeat, 22-17 loss to the defending national no, – I was about to say national champion – world champion, <laughs> yeah. Super Bowl champion, uh, Kansas City Chiefs at home. Uh, entertaining uh, game at many points. Yeah. Um, we were just talking before we came on the air, fellas, that a um, couple of opportunities to win and just didn't get it done. DJ, let's just give, like, I want you to give a 30,000-foot view, uh, somewhat brief. Doesn't have to be two words, okay? I'll let you go to five or ten or maybe 15. <laughs> but if you go if you go to, like, a minute, ah, I'm going to zonk you, okay? Cut him off. 30,000-foot view of what you saw in the game Sunday night. You know what, I, I saw a team that's starting to kind of understand who they are and the things that they can do well. Uh, I think defensively you saw some of what you've seen in the first two ball games. Uh, it's going to be tough to move it on. It's going to be tough to score it on them. Uh, I think offensively you had your moments too where, think about the first drive, you look like world beaters. You go yeah. right down the field and you, you punch it in and, you know, love the aggressive play calling from Zach to start the ball game, pushing it vertical and, you know, taking it to the world champions. You know, yeah. let them know this is going to be a, a long night. And I think ultimately it just came down to the situations of the game. We always talk about it, which they always do, third down, red zone, uh, in the opportunities that you had. And frankly, you know, at the end of the ball game, a couple three and outs, you don't see that happen too often from that team with that quarterback. Yeah. And you yeah. had your opportunities to kind of solidify the ball game and go win it. And a lot of people look at, do you do you, do you win it or do they give it away? You had your opportunity to go win it, and uh, you just didn't execute at the end of the ball game to finish it off. Dave, um, you know, we call a lot of college games. You call a lot of pro games. And I always feel like the time of possession stat is one that needs to be taken with a grain of salt <laughs> in many occasions. But as I was watching this game, um, as I was sitting at my post in Section 119, all I could think to myself was, gosh, it seems like the Chiefs have had the ball the entire (laughs) game. Yeah. Right? And I feel like that statistic did matter in this game. 35 minutes for the Chiefs, 25 minutes for the Falcons. And and the Falcons kind of got back in that time of possession argument towards the end of the game. (laughs) It was even more dominated by Kansas City before kind of late in the fourth quarter. No question about it. I I looked at the same stat rack uh, probably third quarter, early fourth quarter, and Kansas City had run 62 plays and Atlanta had run 26. Yeah. <laughs> and I thought, my goodness, it's worse than I thought. Yeah. You know? But you're right. Two drives late in the game gave you a chance to win the football game. Give credit to the defense for holding on the rope to give you that opportunity to get your footing. And when you did, you began to level it out a little bit. This is three consecutive games now where Atlanta has been minus 10 or worse in the in the time of possession. Mm-hmm. So that's going to have to change. There's, now, there's a, there's a myriad of reasons why. You've got to do a better job, and we'll get into this, obviously, if you want. I know you guys want to, you know, top in a run on defense and then the ability to convert on third down mm-hmm. on offense mm-hmm. and staying in manageable situations <clears throat> there. Um, but th- I don't think there's any question that that stat, albeit can be kind of a moving target, begins to play in if it's three consecutive weeks it's happened. Yeah. And you've you found a way to win one at the end of the game. Right now, give the defense credit again, like we talked about. All three weeks, the defense has provided late uh, heroics, if you will, yep. to provide you an opportunity Correct. to win the football game. Got it done once, um, didn't get it done the other two times. So um, you love that about it. And I think that what Shock said about finding people and or finding themselves, I think it's on a twofold for me. I think that. I think the coordinators are still trying to find their footing a little bit of of co- calling the game and then making those adjustments either at halftime or mid series, mm-hmm. uh, you know, in between mm-hmm. series yep. to try to get to something that's different because you saw Kansas City shift their idea what they want to do. Shock, you and I were talking about this before we went on. That Steve Spagnuolo, when he saw the guys go down on the <laughs> offensive line, yeah, yeah. how, how many you, guys? Here we this? come. Yep. We're, we're, we're going to flood you with more than you can block, and you've got two guys in that haven't played very much, and here we come. And then there's got to be a shift of gears there. But I thought Kirk did that in the game in that I thought Kirk did a really good job of realizing, you know what, I, we can't block him. Yeah. We can't block him a long time. Right. right. Um, I'm going to have to do a better job pre-snap of finding – you don't want to do this as a quarterback. As Shock will tell you, you come to the line of scrimmage, you get a pre-snap look, uh, you have an idea what they're going to do defensively, my and then when then then when I start to drop, 
I confirm what I saw or dispel what I saw and shift my gears in that three and a half seconds to get the ball out or two yep. and a half seconds to get the ball out. I thought Kirk said, you know what? I'm not going to have time to do that after the snap. Yep. I'm going to make a decision now. And I'm going to find the soft corner. Boom, I'm going to bang the hitch. Mm-hmm. I'm going to find that guy that's playing at depth in the in the slot. I'm going to get that guy the football now and took away maybe some of their ability to get to the quarterback. So I thought that he did a really good job of of kind of adjusting his game in game. But I think players are, are kind of working to figure each other out too. Kirk, mm-hmm. I thought, you know, we saw, you know, you had three different guys catch touchdown passes. You have three different guys that caught touchdown passes on this team now, mm-hmm. you know. Uh, you've got guys the the spread of of Ray Ray and and what Mooney's getting and what uh, what Drake's getting and then Kyle got involved you know Kyle started to get involved so I think you're starting to see Kyle uh, um, Kirk start to grow there too yeah. so I think there's learning within the team too about one another in yeah. games one last thing I want to add about the time possession it was good point that you just mentioned Arch, about the number of plays but I wrote this down in my notes as I'm watching the game because it stuck out to me as well and I'm like let me just look at the number. To start the fourth quarter, the time possession was 30 minutes and 58 seconds for the Chiefs, 14 minutes yes. for the Falcons. Yes. So that tells you exactly you what we just talked about. You must have saw it the same time I did because <laughs> I looked and I was like, whoa. <laughs> I should mention that, Wes. Yeah. I said, you realize we've had we, the game has been played for 45 minutes and we've had the ball for 14 minutes? <laughs> Uh, so yeah, that's that part is it, it is a little crazy. Sometimes, like I said, when you're calling a game, you can kind of throw out time of possession because if somebody's a quick strike offense and yeah. they only take two matter. minutes to score, who cares, yeah. Yeah. right? Well, and, and that's not what Kansas City does: is right. possess the ball. They're like what you talk yeah. about: boom, yeah. boom, boom. We're in the end zone. Go ahead and possess the ball. For but a while but anyway. Mahomes kind of shifted. Yeah. Yeah. He put together a bunch of long drives, got kind of dinking and dunking, and you know. I sit back sometimes as a broadcaster, especially as we're here in the Atlanta Falcons podcast studio, and I say, okay, let's try to find the positives. But then the athlete in me, right, the athlete, like when when we lost a game, we all came into the facility the next day and we turned on the tape. What and what's the that? first thing you do? Yeah. What did we mess up? What How do we get yeah. better? How do we fix it? There's yeah. never been a discussion yeah. of, guys, we, I thought we did great here. Yeah. I thought we did this, 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 and this great. That's not how we're wired, No, mm-hmm. right? We're wired to, we weren't good enough. How do we get better? So my question to you is, I'm going to throw out the situation of third down, okay? 29th in the NFL as it stands right now, 22.2%, okay? As it stands... Uh, the last few years, okay, La- Falcons were 40% last year. That was 13th in the NFL. If you look at NFL leaders, the Bills le- led the league the last two years, actually, at 49.8%, 50.3%. The year before that, it was, oddly enough, the Chiefs at 52.2%. Okay, so you can see the delta. Yeah. Yeah. We're 28% from league leaders, yeah. okay? And I've mentioned on this podcast before, you kind of need to be in that 40% above range to give yourself – the best chance to win so now that we've seen three weeks arch what are you seeing on third down and how does atlanta get that phase of their offense better yeah it's it, that's the the what they're tackling right now yeah. about yeah. Uh, 100 yards from us down the hall uh, <laughs> as they're trying to figure f- figure some of that out and in in just a real another capsulization of that think about how bad you've been on third down. You mentioned the third down stuff, which I think is 6 of 27. If you add the for conversions on fourth down in, which were 3 of 6 on fourth down, mm-hmm. you're 9 of 33 in a conversion situation. Right. Brutal. Yes. That's not good enough. Yet you've had a chance to win every game. Every game. <laughs> I mean, every think, game. You know, when you start about positives now, yeah. wait, we're converting at an anemic rate on third down or in four, on fourth down, yet we've had a chance to win every yeah. game. So you yeah. got to hang your hat on that a little bit. So – there's a lot of things you know as well as I do, Rack, and and there's a you got to block better, you got to do better on first down, yep. you know, the, yep. to put yourself in more manageable. But we didn't convert on on third and two. We had a play where they rushed three and dropped eight, and and Kirk got tripped up by the nose tackle as he was trying to escape, and mm-hmm. and here we are punting yep. on third and two. Yep. Mm-hmm. So the execution part of it is part of it, um, but it's gonna it's gonna be a cumulative uh, scenario for me. It's going to be play calling. It's going to be success on first and second down to give you those manageable situations. And then, frankly, you got to make some plays. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You got to go execution. make some plays. Catch the football. Yep. You know, separate. Yep. Give me some separation. If you're going to see teams, and we know this is a copycat league, you can bet the Saints are putting in some of the blitzes they saw Kansas City use. 100%. And they're oh, going to yeah. say, did you fix that this week? Like yeah. you were yep. talking about. Yep. Show me. If we didn't, yeah. then we're going to get 
get a steady diet of it. But with that comes the idea, and I talked to Drake post game. Drake, your quarterback was having a tough time getting the ball out. What do you do? He goes, I got to speed up my process. He says, I don't want to shorten my routes too much because they don't marry with the other routes. But I've got to understand there's a sense of urgency that's heightened because we are having a tough time keeping him upright to get him the ball out. So I've got to, So that idea has to permeate everybody, right, as far as their sense of urgency. Yeah. Uh, and, DJ, I think, you know, going into this game, they'd been running the football fairly well. The Falcons have. And it, if you look at the overall stats, it wasn't terrible. But then when you look at B. John Robinson at 16 carries, 31 yards, that's 1.9 yards per yeah. carry. Like yeah. one of the most electric backs in the league – I feel like that has a lot to do with the lack of success this past week on third down yeah. is because he wasn't able to get going. Yeah. The last couple of weeks, how many times have we seen the turnaround to Bijan where it's been 8-yard carry, 11-yard mm -hmm. carry, 12-yard carry because of either the blocking up front or his ability to make people miss, his contact balance, his ability to keep things moving, physical, you name it. So I think that also lent into them their lack of success on third down as well. Yeah, no doubt about it. And I think it's one of those instances where you look at the ball game, you say, all right, what are the Chiefs trying to do to hinder what we do in the run game? And they were really physical at the point of attack. They were really trying to change the line of scrimmage. And we saw that throughout the ball game. They did that a few times, and knockbacks are big, and it's especially in the up front. But I think when you look at this offense and the way it – can be as successful is through the play action game, which comes from being able to have to run the rock. And I think that's part of it as well. But I think also I saw in the game, I went back and looked and I saw Kirk threw the ball nine times on first down. And I love that. I think that's part of helping mm -hmm. your team yep. is yeah. not coming out, okay, every time it's first down, we're going to run the rock and try to get three, four yards and yep. then establish ourselves there. If you can have a successful first down throw, that gives you an advantage, too. So I love the fact that we were switching it up, and I think we were trying to. And obviously you're going to have games where, you know, that D-line or they're getting penetration at front seven, and it's going to be tough sledding in the run game. And obviously you lose two of your top guys, that's going to make it tougher as well. I know Raw won't say he won't make any excuses. That's why they're on this team. It's a reason why, you know, hey, they're here. We expect them to produce. But sometimes it's different between the ones and the twos, and they're going to play, and they got guys who can get it done. So I think – the mix of just trying to marry the pass game with the run game on those early down situations like Arch talked about, I think will ultimately help both ways, the run game and the pass game, and to help you once you get into that third down situation if you can. I think additionally, you are you need to use the other team's aggression against them. Mm -hmm. So when I begin to look at them trying, they were essentially running through the run game to get to the passer. Mm -hmm. They were flooding every gap with guys coming, which was really blowing up the run game. So how do I use that to their to to my advantage? Part of it is you got to take shots because they were coming up and playing press. And if you remember, if you go back, Kirk missed a couple of shots down the field. One Drake, one inside. That left side and line, instead yeah. of staying up the stem, he did kind of what normal receivers do. He tries to widen to get away from the safety. Because, but he won so quickly, he didn't need to do that. If he'd stayed straight up the stem, that's where Kirk threw the ball. Mm -hmm. But but Drake that quarter that receiver inning says I got to widen I got to go with the safety so when he won inside he widened well the ball hit in here yeah and yeah. they missed but those are the shots you almost take it for granted I remember playing against teams I remember the Cardinals were extremely aggressive back when we used to play them when I was here and you knew your percentage was being down yeah. you, you know these quarterbacks nowadays want to complete sixty five to seventy percent of their balls maybe more than that. Mm -hmm. Against an aggressive team that's playing zero coverage or man coverage, your percentage is going to come down because there's tighter windows to throw in. Yep. You're going to get hit as you're throwing, but you know that you can touch them down the field mm -hmm. with big plays if you just keep trying to do it. And so when you get aggressive teams like that, you've got to take shots. And I thought that we took a couple of shots and missed it. That might need to expand a little bit as you use their aggression against them. Yeah, I was talking to, this was a number of years ago, I was talking to Matt Schaub after he left Falcons and went to the Houston Texans and had all that success. And somehow we got into a rabbit hole talking about blitzing and pressure and stuff. And, and he told me, this is where you can tell a quarterback has grown and they're super comfortable with his game. He was like, 
I love it when people blitz. Like, mm -hmm. I want zero coverage, mm -hmm. he said, because I know I got shots down the field, Just to yeah. your point, right? So, yes, take what the defense is giving you. If they're going to be blitzing, take the shots downfield. Maybe that's the time where you got to get into some screen game, right, where it's yeah. outside guys coming in. It's your running backs coming out of the backfield. A lot of times they say when you when you get a lot of pressure, that's when you start using some screen well, game. Well, another <laughs> piece of that, another piece of that real quickly is, is B. John Robinson. What they did when their pressure – what, what did they do? They took Bijan Robinson out of the game because he was having to yeah, pick but, up. Yeah. So Kyle, I yeah. see that. I'm a defensive coordinator. I'm in I'm in New Orleans. I'm in Tampa. I'm in Carolina over the next three weeks. Yeah. How do I keep him from touching the ball? <laughs> I'm going to blitz him because yeah. they're having him blocked. So now I'm Zach Robinson down the hall here. He says, okay, you want to do that? We're going to hot read you. We're going to get him out. So you can bet down the hall they're talking about – you're not going to be able to pin Bijan Robinson in the, in, in the backfield. Yeah, we're going to get him. We're going to get him out. Correct. And now you better have somebody coming downhill that's pretty close to him, or we're going to have him in space one on one with your guy and man coverage in behind. So before we move on to the next game, I just want you guys to give us like a you know sixty second kind of like what after we've seen this team for three weeks, DJ. What do you feel like is this identity of the team, offensively and or defensively, and where do they need to take the next steps to tar start turning some of these close losses into wins? I think ultimately it's, 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 it's a cliche phrase and a cliche word, but I think we've seen in the first three ball games just the small, minute things that hurt you. And it's the small, minute things in the execution of the little details of the game. Arch just mentioned a easy play of Drake – which is usually what you teach a receiver is once you beat them, get back on top, so you give your quarterback room, stay away from that safety. But I think those smaller details are what's keeping you from having those successful drives or moving the football. Obviously, short yardage has been a big part of the first three ball games, yeah. And being able to execute in those downs I think are huge. But I think this is an offense that has shown you you can score, you can move the football, you got multiple guys who can make you – who I think Ray Ray has become a bigger part of this offense than I think people probably expected he would be. And I love the fact that he's one of those guys that Kirk can lean on now. Mm -hmm. I love the fact that you're taking shots to, to Kyle Pitts now. I think uh, you see multiple things that are happening. Kirk has become a little bit more comfortable, I think, inside the pocket than, you know, obviously he was in that first game. And then on the defense side of the ball, I think it's been fun to watch these guys be able to put all the, the different guys they have and be able to – to gel them together and try to find ways to stop people. And you can see the first, first three weeks, it's been hard for offenses to go and have three, four play drives and go score. I mean, the Chiefs had four play – they had four drives. They had one 17, 13, 11, 11. You got to go work for it. Mm -hmm. And you love that about this defense that – you have the depth to be able to rotate guys in and out and have the opportunity to be able to go get the, the opposing team's offense. So it's 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 a mixed bag on both sides for sure. There's always a lot that you can work on on both sides. But I think this is a team we saw in the first three ball games, like we just talked about. At the end of the ball game, they're sitting right there. Even with some deficiencies, even with some of the you know, lack of execution, they stand there with an opportunity to win the ball game. Let me ask you fellas this. Okay. Mm -hmm. So it, the number one question in your mind – as far as we, we were talking about being able to get the run game going on offense and and blending together and being better on third down, how do you be better on third down? So we flipped it over to the other side. Yeah. Okay. The number one problem right now defensively is, in your mind, what? Probably, well, I think it reared its head. It was getting off the field on third down. Okay, getting off the field on third down. So they're staying in – teams are staying in manageable third down situations – which means what, Chuck? They're running the football, and Atlanta's had a really difficult time of keeping the run game hemmed in. I yeah. think that, I think the Chiefs, who weren't really supposed to be able to run it without Pacheco and the young kid Steele, played really well. Right. Um, they still ran for about 125, 130 yards. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We went into the game giving up 161 yards a game yeah. on the ground. So. Yeah. That's lending itself to not being able to get off the field. Mm -hmm. So. In you in in you guys' mind, what what needs to happen to try to limit the run game? What what do you what are you thinking as far as that goes to try to get you in third and long situation? Yeah, I mean more pressure. Obviously, people winning at the line of scrimmage um, can't getting not getting pushed out of the holes. I mean, there's a lot of things that go into it. 
Um, but yeah, I mean, I, to your point, everybody will tell you that in, to win in the National Football League, you have to stop the run. Yeah. If you don't stop the run, and this was actually one of my keys to the game, is that just when you think because they don't have Isaiah Pacheco, oh, we're, we're going to be good on defense. Like, mm-hmm. we're going to be good against the run. We just need to focus on Patrick Mahomes. And it was like they slowly but surely end up ripping off four, six, five, first down, and they end up with 120. Yeah. When they should have had, that should have been a game where they finished with 40 rushing. Yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah. They should have finished with 40 rushing yards. I thought they were diligent in it, though. I think that was a part of it is I don't think they wanted to bludgeon you where, hey, we're going to run it, you know, 40 times. They wanted to be able to run the ball just when they needed to, just enough. You know what I mean? And I think that was part of their plan. And then the other part was Patrick Mahomes being patient. Yeah, he we was wasn't, really good. We wasn't trying to give up the big play, so it was like, all right, here's a four or five-yard gain over here. Here's a little hitch over here. Here's a flat route. Here's a, you know, six-yard catch here. And before you know it, you know, they're moving the chain. So I think that was part of their plan, which was a big uh, success for them. And I, I think it's it's one of those things that it's hard because you say, all right, do you want to add more guys to the fray now? So now you say, all right, you add more guys to the fray, but you got a lot of dudes in this league who, oh, now we got seven in the box, <laughs> bringing that safety down? Okay. We got one-on-one on the outside. Can you guys yeah. hold up? Just like so what we were just talking about with us, right? Yeah, yeah a, that, and that's the crux, really – is if you look at the defense, we just talked about how the defense has played really well late in a football game to get you the ball back and kind of keep the game in perspective, albeit they've been on the field a ton. Yep. You've got a chance to we've had a chance to win all three games. Yep. So now do I shift my mind thinking if I'm Raheem Morris and, and Jimmy Lake, do I get more aggressive mm-hmm. and potentially expose myself to shots down the field and or big plays? Or do we play we just you know, want to get the offense up to speed and continue to play it the way we are. Hold on to the rope defensively, and our defense is going to our offense is going to get up to speed, and pretty soon you're going to win be winning the game. There's that whole yeah. adjustment battle. You know, not playing with your own head. Type exactly, of exactly. <laughs> so uh, even though Falcons do come away with the loss, was a couple of milestones in the game. Justin Simmons with an interception. That's oddly enough his fourth straight game against the Chiefs with an interception. Dude, he has owned Patrick Mahomes. <laughs> oh, he got like six now, he, like, <laughs> he's got yeah. six interceptions. Yeah. He's the he's got the most interceptions against Patrick Mahomes of any big. Now they played twice a year, Correct. which which which. Correct. Lends itself. That's 31 interceptions for him. He's got more interceptions than anyone since he came in the league in 2016. And I thought that was part of what you were talking about with knowing one another. Mm-hmm. Remember, go back to the Eagle game. If you go back to the Eagle game, and they found they I can't remember who they found Devonte Smith or whoever in the middle of the end zone for a touchdown. And you saw Bates and and Simmons look at each other, mm-hmm. right? right? Like there was supposed to, something yeah. was supposed to happen. Didn't happen this game because no. Bates was base rolled up, Simmons rolled over the top, intercepted the pass, and I thought you talk about growth now. It's just one week. Exactly. Those two guys working you think, together. You, you think Patty Mahomes went to him after the game, bro? Like, hey, hey, for real, like, what can I you do? Get, can you give How? me one game on, like, where you bro. don't pick me off? He's got a full, <laughs> he's got a full shelf <laughs> of Patrick <laughs> Mahomes balls. <laughs> well, Patrick Mahomes ain't worried about it. He said, <laughs> oh, I got a shelf got full a shelf of three term yeah. trophies. I got, got Lombardi trophies over here. Uh, the other two notable things, uh, 274 career passing touchdowns for uh, Kirk Cousins passing Joe Montana. Kirk wow. That's quite the name How to be that? passing. And then Kirk, uh, now fourth fastest player to 40,000 passing yards in his career, uh, tied with Dan Marino as the fourth fastest. He got a few more to get. He got a few to get. Yards. He still got a few to get to my boy Art, so, so you know what I'm saying? <laughs> No, he, he might he have gone by more. me in the first game he went. <laughs> All right, that's going to wrap up the Chiefs. Let's go ahead. Let's fast forward real quick because we got Saints week. Time. Not only do we got Saints week, fellas, Thanks. we got a big, call it five-day stretch mm. in division where you got Saints at home, you got Bucks at home, and we're going to get Bucks at home on, on prime time. So let's start with the Saints. Um, Arch, you've been in the, the color analyst seat for how many years now? <laughs> no, 21 years. This he's, laughing. 21. he's laughing back because he okay. knows he's already so, filled it. So you've seen 40-plus <laughs> games oh, against the Saints. And I had to play against them, too. That, <laughs> yeah. So collectively, games. in this room, there's a lot of experience <laughs> yeah, against the no New Orleans Saints. No so for those folks that are new to our podcast or new today, I want you to kind of give them a little bit of snapshot of what Saints Falcons week Ooh, is like. Back. Let me well, sit back I mean, <laughs> this is it's interesting because the two teams kind of came in about the same time, all right? In the 66, 67 era, I think one came in one year and one came in the next. So you've been around a long time. 
you kind of got stuffed in the NFC West. We don't know where to put them. <laughs> we don't we'll put them out there with the 49ers they're, and they're Rams. Okay, the South, we'll, shove, the we'll shove them out with the 49ers and the Rams. We'll that make them sense. play those guys. Yeah. So you kind of came in together. You kind of got you kind of got shuffled off to the West Coast together, and now we are back together here in the South. Um, there's obviously these are the two teams that are kind of the South's teams. Now, obviously, there's been some other teams come in in Florida. Miami has been down there for a long time. But Miami doesn't feel like the, a southern state. Miami <laughs> feels like a, like a state that, that has got their own thing. The southern states, I'm talking about the deep south. These are the two deep south teams. And subsequently, there's border wars when it comes to, when it comes to this. And so the Saints uh, have, a, have a certain feeling about Atlanta Falcons, and the Atlanta Falcons have a certain feeling. And it doesn't just permeate the fans. Yeah. It's, it's the players, too. Mm-hmm. The players yeah. dislike. Now, you don't hate anybody on that side. Now, there may be some fans that do that. Yeah. But – this has been it, originally. It was because you didn't want to be the team that was in last in the NFC West, mm-hmm. and so you banged heads with the Saints. Okay, you're the bottom. Remember the bags <laughs> on their heads? Bags yeah. bags? Yes. And then there was a time they flipped it a little bit, and they wanted us on the bottom. They're pounding now. It, it, over the last twenty years, when Matt Ryan and Drew Brees showed up, now all of a sudden there was this transition to where you were battling for supremacy mm-hmm. and who was going to be the top dog and, and, and all that kind of stuff. And it's settled back and forth between. But make no mistake, because of the, the lineage and how long it's lasted, all the way back to the mid-60s to now, and then battling for the basement or battling for, for, the, for the high-rise apartment, yep. Yep. that's where this thing comes from. Um, then there's been some phenomenal players on both sides. Yeah, that's for sure. Um, Shock, let's – Kind of give the listeners and viewers a little bit of snapshot of what Atlanta is going to be facing in the Saints, okay? Obviously, they were one of the stories of the league after the first two weeks, scoring, what, 45 and a half points per game mm-hmm. over their first Ooh. two games. And then they end up getting beat at home against the Eagles, the team that the Falcons just beat, 15 to 12. So they just scored 12 <laughs> points after averaging 45 and a half yeah. in their first two, and they only scored 12 at home. So give people kind of a little snapshot of what the Saints are this year. It's a team, like you just mentioned, that came into the year scoring a lot of points. 103 points to start in three games, 12 touchdowns on the season, now averaging about 34 a game now because of last week took it down just a little bit just from what they have been doing. (laughs) But this was a team that I think, you know, through their first couple – ball game they scored in like first like 15 possessions mm. or something crazy yeah. like that yeah. and you can see the explosiveness from this team on the offensive side Derek Carr obviously a guy who's been around for a while has played in this league for a while understands exactly what it means to play at a high level he's been doing that uh 585 yards six tubs and two ints on the season but I think ultimately this offense runs through a guy who we've seen for the last, I don't know, umpteen years Showing in Alvin up. Kamara. Number 41, and they put him all over the place. And he's a guy that when you come in, you're circling from day one, where is this guy going to line up? Because he's going to line up anywhere on, on the football field. And obviously another guy, Taysom Hill, another guy who was a couple years ago came in and played quarterback for him and won a couple games for him against us. Uh, another Swiss Army knife that they use in all different kind of ways. Uh Rashid Shahid, another guy on the outside, a burner. I'm talking about a burner. Dude's averaging 24 yards a reception right now. Chris Olave on the outside. Foster Monroe is a, a, a good, pretty good tight end. Offensively, they want to stretch you. They want to score points. They want to use Ivan Kamara. They want to put him in space. And Derek Carr is a gunslinger. That's mm-hmm. kind of what he's been. Defensively, we've seen Cam Jordan over the years. Uh, he was mad when Matt – Kind of uh, <laughs> when, when Matt retired, he felt like you know career, that was his guy. Yeah. You know, so uh, but this is a defense that's got eleven sacks, five interceptions on the season, and we talk about third down. They're holding opponents to thirty five percent on third down. Yeah. So that tells you Big they're getting after there. people on first and second down, and they're getting people off the field. Uh, only gave a one pass touchdown all season, so they're a tough, gritty guy. Lattimore on the back end, we know the physicality, the talking that he plays with Tyron Matthew, the Honey Badger. We know he's a guy who. Kind of has like a, uh, I mean, he, he, he finds the football, mm-hmm. just to say the least. Yep. Uh, Demario uh, Davis on the inside, really love him as a linebacker. Hate him when he plays us, but a guy you know just is all over the field, tackle machine. So this is a, a always been a fun and scrappy defense, a tough defense. They're yep. going to get after you. Yep. Uh, but this is exactly how these New Orleans teams have always been made. Really good defense, offenses that want to score points and threaten you down the field. It should be an interesting matchup. 
Dennis Allen kind of got his 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 career kind of took yeah. off after after coaching for the Falcons back when when I was on the team there in the early two thousands and and I swear he was like a defensive assistant that was holding up scout team cards <laughs> and and his stock just continued to shoot after he left here and then obviously you got a little bit of a not this like maybe a reverse homecoming between Caden Ellis and David Onyemata <laughs> yeah. uh, having come from the Saints organization but there's a lot of familiarity as you guys mentioned there's a lot of uh, uh, great players, but, but Arch, I'm going to just kind of finish this conversation. He mentioned Alvin Kamara. Like, like, how do you slow down a guy that's been as productive as he is? I mean, because when he came into the league, he kind of showed a lot of this. And then I think he got banged up a little bit, and production maybe fell off to his standards a little bit. But the first couple of weeks of the season, it was like, oh, this is the Alvin Kamara that everybody yeah. got used to seeing. How do you slow down a dynamic player like that? Well, it's it's, it's going to be get a lot of hats to the football, right? <laughs> yeah. you got to get a lot of hats to the football. I, you limit his opportunities so, so he, they can't have the ball for 35 minutes of the game yeah. or you're not going to like the finish on that. So limit his opportunities. But I think what you do to a guy, you're not going to – he's going to touch the ball. They're going to give it to him. They're going to throw it to him. What you need to do is make him pay every time he touches it. Mm-hmm. And – in all honesty, you go back and think about. I remember Deion Jones knocked him out of the game uh, when we were when here in Atlanta. That's the way you got to play. You're not trying to hurt the guy, but you got to make him feel every time he touches the football, it's going to be an all day scenario where there are going to be three or four hats at the ball every time. Yep. Now, obviously, you can't triple team him or anything like that because Chris Olave is going to beat you <laughs> or Rashid Shahid's going to get deep. So they've got other guys to get the football to. But if he's their focal point, which I, I agree with you guys, I think he's going to be, and they're going to test Atlanta. Can you stop the interior run? Yeah. Atlanta does not stop, and they didn't stop the interior run the entire second half for the most part against against Kansas City. Um, they're going to test that interior area. How are you going to take that away? Because and then you got to make him pay when he touches the football. Yeah, I'm, so a couple of things stick out to me. Uh, yes, I agree with you. They're going to try to take some shots because they got the speed to do it on the outside. They're going to test the run defense, and I think third downs is going to be a, a great matchup on the other side because of this New Orleans defense. I mean, there's they're some really good players, and it's going to it's going to make well, for they're, a they're very defense. competitive. Yeah, I agree with you on that, uh, Rack. Their defense, and Shock, you did a really good job of breaking down the guys that are on that side. They are physical. This is a physical group now. Mm-hmm. They pride themselves on negative plays and taking the ball away. Mm-hmm. Okay, and they can. Get get frustrated on that side but you mentioned 11 sacks they've got five interceptions already in just three weeks to compare that to Atlanta Atlanta has three sacks and two interceptions (laughs) they've got 11 sacks already they've got two guys with three Carl Granderson has turned into a monster and Brian Breezy the guy that played just up the street uh, in Clemson Breezy's turned into a really good (laughs) interior player so they got edge and interior there the two linebackers are good Warner and Davis but they're going to try to take the ball away from you, and they want negative plays. If you can keep them on the field, you fight, you start grinding them a little bit, and, and they start getting frustrated. So that'll be a key for the offense. And it's obviously one of those games where the physicality is going to be there, but you've also got to be extremely disciplined because in these rivalry matchups, we've seen it before, tempers start flaring a little bit. And and listen, it, it wouldn't be football yeah. or rivalry matchup if there wasn't a little bit of trash talk, yeah. okay? But it's just got to make sure that it doesn't go too far to where you end up with a first down, and then all of a sudden it's personal foul, 15-yard penalty because some jawing that's been going on or pushing and shoving after the fact. But, hey, that's what everybody loves, a, a big-time rivalry matchup. Rack was, was an instigator. No you doubt. Know, he he would that. come down. He would run down those Give you a little shoulder. A little shot on somebody. Yeah, yeah. As yeah. he's running off, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Turn his head to you, then you get pushed in Sense the back. a little yeah, yeah. bit of sarcasm. That. <laughs> no, that's not true. That's not true. I could go find some film on it. <laughs> Two big games coming up. We obviously you worry about the first one. It's all about the Saints. You get in the division, it's like it's like two for one, right? You get two wins. Falcons lose a game last week, but you get the Saints lose, you get the Bucks to lose last week. So it's it's not the worst thing in the world, but things have got to start trending positively. Michelle. And you do that with a divisional opponent coming to your house. Yeah, baby. This Sunday against the Saints, Falcons will be back in action. We'll be back here next week to break everything down. Thanks so much for joining us here on the Falcons Audible presented by AT&T. That's Shock. That's Arch. I'm Rack. We'll see you next week, everybody. Dogs and Bama coming up this weekend, baby.